This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Check out our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, at youtube.com slash UCTV Prime. Subscribe today to get new programs every week. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Rick Ridgway from Patagonia. And uh, Rick, we're really thrilled to have you here today. We're looking forward to your uh, remarks. Let me tell you a little bit about his fascinating uh, background. So uh, just a word or two about Patagonia first, uh, based in uh, Ventura, California, founded in 1972. And the mission statement of the company is very focused on environmental issues and social uh, impact. And its uh, mission statement is the following. I love this mission statement. Build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. So that's a really nifty uh, mission statement and one that we all agree with as well. So Rick oversees Patagonia's environmental uh, grant marketing, sorry, grant making, its environmental uh, education and environmental projects, including com the Common Threads Initiative and Freedom to Roam, a coalition he founded to seek protection uh, for wildlife corridors. Rick also manages Patagonia Productions, the company's division that publishes books and produces films. He's played a lead role in establishing an industry-wide eco-index for measuring and evaluating apparel and footwear product sustainability. In addition to his business history, Rick is a writer, a photographer, and an Emmy award-winning filmmaker who's produced and directed more than 30 adventure shows for television. He's authored several books, including Seven Summits, The Shadows of Kilimanjaro, and Below Another Sky. His articles have appeared in Outside, National Geographic, Reader's Digest, and many other publication outlets. Rick's international reputation is one of the world's most form foremost mountaineers and adventurers, and that prompted Rolling Stone magazine to call him the real Indiana Jones. If I were you, that would be the thing I'm most proud of, actually, is that, that label. That's a, that's a cool label. <clears throat> Rick was a member of the first American team to reach the summit of K2 near the Pakistan-China border. Uh, which is one of the tallest and toughest mountains in the world to climb. Rick has also been honored with National Geographic's Lifetime Achievement in Adventure Award. So please join me in welcoming Rick Ridgway. Rick, welcome. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Steve, for the, the introduction. And um, as he said, I am the VP of Environmental Initiatives at Patagonia. And uh, that's got to be the coolest job on the planet. Uh, I get to come up with uh, ideas for sustainability and uh, nurture and grow them in the company, uh, integrate them into our operations, and move on to the next idea. So uh, I've been doing that full time for about six years, <clears throat> but have been with the company. Uh, as a close friend of uh, the owner, Yvonne Chouinard, and his climbing partner, and also uh, someone who's done uh, oddball marketing jobs for them since their very beginning, and even before that when they were just a small company making uh, tools for mountain climbers. So this morning I was going to, I will be presenting uh, or showing a presentation that covers some of that early history of the company. Uh, then takes a little deeper dive into two of those initiatives uh, that I've overseen uh, that I think would be of interest to all of you. Our Common Threads initiative, uh, we'll take a little closer look at that. And then an even deeper dive into uh, this effort to develop a, an indexing tool, uh, as Steve said, an eco-index that really does, uh, more than anything that's been developed to date, measure the environmental and, as I'll explain, social labor impacts of manufacturing stuff uh, in our sector. And as you'll hear at the end of the presentation, <coughs> we hope 
uh, and envision uh, perhaps in other sectors of manufactured goods in the not too distant future. So, let's begin with a brief history, uh, an overview of Patagonia that's headquartered in Ventura and perhaps most importantly is privately held. And as Yvonne says, <coughs> that means we get to do what we want and what we want to do is uh, as uh, Steve introduced uh, our mission statement to provide and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. And that's why we're in business. <coughs> it's not to give Yvonne and his family a, a Gulf Stream. He still drives a, an old Toyota Beater and he still flies coach uh, and he lives pretty simply. So it's a company that has a really distinct culture and you pick up on it as soon as you walk in the door and meet the receptionist, uh, Chipper Bro, who uh, if my business card should say the real Indiana Jones, uh, his might tell you that he's won two world championships in Frisbee. And he takes every summer off to run uh, his surf school uh, where his chief instructor uh, is my son. And so, like I said, at Patagonia, it's all in the family. Chipper, if you looked around from his desk, uh, the view would look like this onto the playground where kids come in every day to our daycare center so the parents can have lunch with them on our campus, which is called the Aloha Cafe, and mothers can breastfeed their kids in privacy. And the daycare was started by Yvonne's wife, uh, Melinda, who you see here next to uh, Yvonne when their son Fletcher was a little toddler and he's now uh, 36 years old and works in the company uh, making uh, our surfboards. And their daughter Claire works in the company uh, also in the design department. And Yvonne is, you know, like me, a, a lifelong uh, surfer, uh, but he's most famously known as probably most of you know as a, a rock climber where uh, in Yosemite that you see behind there, he got his start in the 50s and 60s on the, on the big walls. Uh, and that's also where he started as a businessman. Um, you know, not a regular businessman, but a, a blacksmith making mountain climbing gear, first for himself and, and then for his friends, and then, and then selling it to his buddies and, and their buddies. And as I said in the beginning, it was called Chenard Equipment. And the very first products were these pitons, the metal spikes that climbers uh, used to drive uh, into rock cracks to protect their ascents. But then in the late 60s and early 70s, Yvonne and other climbers could see that these pitons were causing permanent damage to uh, the rock. That every time uh, a party went up a route, uh, they would hammer in a piton and then uh, the guy following would take it back out, leaving uh, expanding holes, permanently damaging holes in the cracks. So Yvonne came up with another solution, uh, another way that climbers could protect their ascents with these aluminum wedges that you see draped around his neck here. And uh, they started selling like hotcakes. Pretty soon they displaced pitons. And this was a fundamental lesson for the business. Fundamental that you could uh, make a change in your business motivated by environmental protection and end up having that change strengthen the business and the sales. Fundamental experience to drive our, our values. Well, there was another core lesson that happened about the same time that I was sharing with uh, some of your colleagues this morning at breakfast when we learned that the river, the Ventura River that flows just behind our headquarters was scheduled for development. The city council had had, was about to sign off uh, on a, the uh, construction of a mega resort right at the mouth of the river, right behind our headquarters, which was going to take out the surf break. And the surf break was why we were there. That's why Yvonne put the company there, because it was two blocks from a really good surf break at Ventura Point. So uh, we uh, went down to the city council thinking it was a done deal. Uh, only to learn, uh, at the, only to, uh, to witness at the end of it, a single individual, a young man, a wildlife biologist, get up and show the whole city council that the Ventura River wasn't dead at all. That in fact it was alive with all this wildlife that was in his slideshow. And it was so emotional that he turned around the city council and he, and he killed the deal. And it's still like it is now. That was a fundamental lesson 
uh, for us that Yvonne's going to talk about in this commercial that I'm about to show you, which um, at the end, I didn't know how to edit this part out, I would have lopped it off. You'll see is made for American Express. Uh, well, we had to kind of, that was a little bit of a trade-off for us. The trade-off was that it aired on Oscar night and a billion people heard the message. In the 70s, the city wanted to channelize the Ventura River and there was a city council meeting and so we decided to all go because we were concerned that it was going to hurt the sand flow. And so we showed up and there were all these scientists there saying it's not going to hurt the river because it's a dead river, so just forget about it. And at the end of the talk, a young grad student got up and showed a slideshow of all the life along the river. All the eels and the birds that nest along the river and the raccoons. There was still 50 steelhead that go up that polluted river. And it wasn't dead at all. And that brought the house down and it showed me what one individual can do. The power of one individual. That led to us starting a Friends of the Ventura River. And now we're working on trying to take out a dam upstream that is preventing uh, the steelhead from going up into uh, one of the tributaries. I really like the idea of taking out no longer useful dams. When you take out a dam, that's a real victory. I mean, a concrete victory, so to speak. It's gone. And then that allows fish to migrate up. It uh, stops the water from heating up. People built those dams, and people have the responsibility to take them down. I think all of us are responsible for doing something. I mean, if you can, you're a good speaker, you should get out and speak about the injustices of the world. You know, if you're a good writer, write about it. If you have nothing but free time, you should volunteer for good causes. To do good, you actually have to do something. Well, we'll cut it short there. <laughs> but um, by the early 90s, uh, these two lessons informed our mission statement that you heard at the introduction. Uh, and this is not just window dressing at Patagonia, but this drives our short and long-term decisions and actions on a daily, a monthly, and yearly basis. So I'm going to use this mission statement to uh, frame the rest of my morning's presentation. And I want to start with this first uh, component of it to build the best product. Well, it's uh, in there because uh, it is foundationally rooted uh, in our company's heritage of making the best climbing gear uh, that you can get. And we started the clothing line in the early, uh, late 60s, uh, and then uh, as an addition to the climbing line, clothes for climbers. And we spun it off in the early 70s when we decided to uh, make, our, uh, d make the clothing division separate, and we called it uh, Patagonia. Well, I said a few minutes ago that we're in business to provide solutions to the environmental crisis, and we also know that the only way uh, other companies can respect us and maybe even follow our lead as if we remain successful as business. And as Yvonne said, uh, it's okay to be eccentric as long as you're rich because otherwise people just think you're crazy. So we are successful. We have to be that to be a good example. In fact, the last two years have been the most profitable years in the company's 30-year history. And those profits go into the second part of our three-part mission statement. And those are the parts of our mission statement that I'm uh, in charge of. Uh, beginning with this uh, commitment to cause no unnecessary harm. Now, that means reducing the environmental impact of uh, the stuff that we make as much as possible. Now, notice that it doesn't say cause the least harm, but rather no unnecessary harm. That's very purposeful because the flip side of uh, unnecessary harm is the recognition that all business causes harm. But that doesn't mean that um, you can't develop a model of continual improvement, and even, even knowing that you'll never get there because you can always do better. That it, you don't strive always to reduce the footprint of, that you always strive to continue to reduce the footprint of making your stuff. So, so how do we do that? Well, we have several programs and initiatives that are focused on just that. Uh, and one of them we launched uh, just this year, uh, the Common Threads uh, Partnership <clears throat> with our customers to take responsibility for the entire life cycle of the stuff that we make and that they buy. So we decided to structure this partnership around the uh, four R's because 
First of all, everybody was already familiar with them and we didn't have to invent a, a new lexicon. And you can see there that under each R, we've come up with what we think should be um, our parts of the, this partnership and what we think should be the obligations of our customers. Now, when we first uh, started to develop this idea a couple years ago, we also decided early on and we wanted to uh, inspire people to join us in this, in this effort, to take the Common Threads pledge. So to do that, we uh, made a video that we think emotionally captures what we're trying to get them to do so that it just isn't some intellectual alignment in, in people's heads, but, but it's a connection uh, and a commitment uh, to, uh, to the heart. Though we now use the resources of one and a half planets, we have only one to call home. We are exhausting the earth, and the time has come to live within our means. To reimagine a world in which we take nothing from nature that we cannot replace. This is something we can do. This is something we are called to do. And if we are quiet, we will surely hear it. To do more with less, make fewer things. Pursue not what we vaguely want, but what we deeply need. This we have the power to do together, to act on behalf of the natural world that sustains us. Living is not fine. To be a citizen of the earth is to put one's brief life to the use of one's dearest gifts, to summon the better angels of our nature, to own up to all the harm that we do, and then do all in our power to put an end to it. Our way of doing business has outgrown our planet and now merely runs on reserves. A new economy must rise in its place that better meets our fundamental purpose, provides balance, and gives nature a chance to rest and time to heal. Join us. We will be citizens and ambassadors, each with the destiny of our own, but with a common pledge to honor life and nature. I invite all you guys to go to the website and take the Common Threads uh, pledge. We'd really appreciate you doing that. Uh, also, this is an aside uh, for those of you in the room who are kind of focused on marketing. Um, we worked on this a long time, and it took us a long time to find the tone that we felt we were after. And uh, we looked and looked around, and finally, we found it in a couple of early speeches from John F. Kennedy, and then we really found it in Teddy's eulogy to John at his funeral. And the whole tone of this thing was, was taken from that. Uh, and it was inspired by the Kennedy brothers, especially Robert more than anything, who really had that vision of collectively coming together as a society and a, and a culture to bring permanent change and improvement to the world. So, you know, when you're looking for inspiration for something, uh, you gotta sometimes dig back into the National Archives, and there it was for us. Well, let's take a little bit uh, of, a, a pa, uh, of a look into uh, some of those uh, four R's, uh, starting with this commitment to repair it um, if it's broken. And we have a repair facility in our warehouse, which is in Reno, that can turn around uh, products in a, in a week. So we have messages in our stores and on our website that encourage our customers to uh, bring it back if it's broken, uh, and it can still be used, and, and we'll fix it and get it back to you. So in a similar way, we're encouraging our customers also to clean out their garages and their closets of their Patagonia gear if it's still serviceable and, and put it back into circulation. So here we wanted to help them find uh, 
ways to find uh, a new home uh, for their gear. So we looked around and realized that since the biggest market for used stuff was uh, eBay, that maybe we should partner with them. So uh, I got a hold of them, kind of just called them up and told them what we were up to, and, and they liked the idea. And that started a uh, year-long uh, back and forth uh, with them uh, that resulted uh, just a few months ago, five months ago, when uh, the Common Threads uh, site within a site launched on eBay, where you can, uh, if you want to sell a used Patagonia product, uh, you can go to this part of the site, uh, take the Common Threads pledge, as I just asked all you guys to do, uh, and then here's the real secret sauce, that uh, if you do that, then your gear gets listed uh, in the regular part of eBay, it gets listed in this special storefront, which uh, is going to continue to have enhancements moving forward. And then it gets co-listed on Patagonia.com in our used, our buy use section. And we do that taking no commission at all as a favor uh, to you for cleaning out your garage or your closet and putting the stuff back into circulation. Um, and then, uh, so far, that has been really successful. I don't have the exact numbers, but it, it's now just since launch in the tens of thousands of products that have moved through this sitelet uh, by people that have taken the pledge. But then we also tell the customers that if the stuff's really worn out and can't be repaired or resold, then we ask them to bring it back to us and we'll recycle it uh, using uh, the best technology available. And we have bins in our stores where uh, they bring the used gear uh, back in, and then we um, send it up to uh, this uh, Reno where it's uh, rebundled and sent on empty ships going back to Japan in containers that are otherwise empty. And there, partnering with one of our vendors, uh, they go into a machine that, uh, for the polyester garments, truly recycles the clothes uh, in, a, in a real, closed loop uh, technology that breaks, chemically breaks down the polyester uh, and it recombines it so that at the other end of the machine you get polyester pellets coming out that are identical to the ones that are made uh, from virgin fiber. But the petroleum that has been used in the original fiber is captured permanently in this closed loop that at the same time reduces the energy use uh, over the virgin process by 70%, and the greenhouse gas emissions are reduced by 75%. Now, that's pretty cool. But we also realized that maybe the easiest and most effective way to reduce the impact of stuff on the planet uh, is to create a, a new relationship between people and their stuff that convinces them that they don't need as much stuff in the first place. So you don't even have to repair it or resell it or recycle it. So that takes us back to the most controversial part of this initiative. And it's the part that's really stirred the pot uh, outside and inside the company. And it was the first of those four R's where we ask our company, our customers to reduce what they're consuming. And uh, this was pretty hard to sell internally. Um, took me four years, in fact, to get everybody lined up. Uh, Yvonne liked the idea right away. So uh, I had that going for me, but Patagonia is not a top-down company uh, at all. And just because I liked it and Yvonne liked it, that didn't mean it was gonna happen by any means. And in fact, I was sharing again at breakfast with some of your colleagues how you know, I can remember even recently Vaughn coming to me and going, Jesus Christ, I, I can't get my idea through. That's getting roadblocked here and there. And I said, Yvonne, you own the place. And he goes, I know, but I, I still can't get anything going on. So <laughs> the place is really horizontal. Everybody is really empowered there to, um, uh, you know, to develop their own project, develop their own ideas. And if they don't like something, they can resist. Well, the sales department wasn't too thrilled with my idea of telling our customers not to buy our stuff. Uh, as I said, it started about four years ago, but if there's anything I learned <laughs> climbing K2 where we were actually above base camp for 68 days in a row before we 
finally got to the summit, knocked back by six storms, is that you know you don't give up just because some storm pushes you back to base camp. So four years after I started this project, as some of you I think probably saw on Black Friday in the New York Times, uh, full page, we ran this ad uh, illustrating what was one of our top four best sellers. Uh, and then in the copy, uh, trying to encourage people to think twice about whether they needed to buy this jacket or anything else for Christmas. And in fact, if you didn't need it, to not buy it. And then if you did need it, to buy it, but, but do your homework. And buy it if it's well made and if it's going to last you a long time. And uh, if it's even something that will last so long, you can pass it on to your kit. That's what we think is going to be uh, the real solution to uh, reducing the impact of stuff. Well, I should say maybe the single biggest uh, thing you can do, the lowest hanging fruit, as it were. So the result of the ad was that on our website, where again, we're trying to encourage people uh, to take the pledge, we had a huge surge. <laughs> in people coming on. And uh, in just a few weeks now, uh, we've had about um, 30, I think close to 35,000 people that have taken the pledge. So again, I would ask all of you guys to go on there, uh, sign up, and then use your Facebook and Twitter to get your buddies to do it as well. Because we're also asking you to not just take the pledge and, and uh, and redefine your relationship with stuff, but to join us in reimagining the planet where we can figure out how we can only take from it what it can give back. Now that leads to the third part of the mission statement, which is to use our business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. And we use that word crisis because we think that's exactly uh, what we're in. You've seen the statistics, I'm sure, that uh, you know, this year uh, humans collectively are using about 1.4 to 1.5 Earths. You know, that means that we're beyond uh, uh, our carrying capacity uh, by about 140 to 150 percent. And we all know uh, what the causes are, that there's uh, too many of us, 7 billion now, and we're heading to 9 billion. And if you really parse those numbers, you find out that the biggest problem is not uh, the extra 2 billion people, but the additional influence of those people using too much stuff that has too big an impact. It's affluence that's really going to drive the problems that we're all going to face. So what do you do about that? Well, before I explain one response we've had to this issue. I'll pause to take a look at something that just about everybody I'm sure uh, probably has, a, a pair of jeans. Um, I got my Patagonia jeans on right now, so clearly it didn't cost $39.95, but let's just imagine for argument's sake that you've gone to a department store and you bought a pair of popular jeans that are at a reasonable price. And you know, I know that I'm speaking to the converted here, and all you guys know this, but you're only paying a fraction of the true cost of those genes because they don't capture the externalized cost. They don't capture the fact that that pair of genes has emitted 83 pounds of CO2 or five pounds of waste or that much energy or that much water. And these externalized costs explain why on a global basis, we're using the resources of 1.5 Earths. And on the, in the US here, as you probably know, on a per capita basis, seven Earths. And with China and India and the BRIC companies uh, catching up, you can see why, despite all the current sustainability efforts of uh, leading companies, uh, this situation is still unsustainable. Uh, it's dangerously, dangerously unsustainable. You pencil out those numbers that I just shared with you to 2050, and it's not 140 percent. 
it's just under 500 percent, and that's conservative. Five times the carrying capacity of planet Earth. Well, what do you do about that? Well, that's a, that is the challenge of our time. That is the challenge that all you guys in the room here are, are, are going to face. I, I predict that it's going to fundamentally challenge uh, the whole capitalist assumption of growth. Uh, I don't think there's any way around that. But we don't have any idea how you challenge that one. But we have come up with uh, another idea, and it's a trend that's unfolding right now that promises at least part of a roadmap to get back to a condition of uh, living within our means where uh, maybe we can take from the planet only what it can give back. And it's inspired by that truism that you can't manage what you don't measure. So we've uh, launched a multi-stakeholder coalition of companies that have joined uh, academics. We've got several universities involved, uh, NGOs. We've got uh, a half dozen of the biggest ones in the world and government agencies in North America and Europe uh, to work together to create a tool that measures the full impact of making stuff both on the Earth's natural capital as well as its human capital. And the, the tool is super robust. It measures uh, those impacts cradle to grave, uh, beginning with natural resource extraction, goes upstream all the way to the headwaters of uh, a product's creation. It measures the impacts uh, in the fabrication and the manufacturing phase. Uh, it measures impacts in packaging and shipping. Uh, it also takes into account of how the impacts from uh, consumers' use and care of products, and then it takes them all the way through to uh, end of life and how they're disposed. And it's called a value chain uh, index, or what in shorthand we call a VCI. Now to understand this uh, a little bit better, uh, think of the various categories of impact uh, that I just described to you up above there uh, along the life cycle stages of a product is the, the where of the places where products have their impact on the environment. But to measure those impacts, you have to think of each of these stops along the way as what is being impacted. And this is a lens that we have in the tool that allows us to see the impacts on uh, land use uh, and uh, of, of manufacturing stuff. Uh, we have lenses that allow us to see and measure, important word, to measure the impacts on uh, water, on waste, and on biodiversity, on ecosystems and their services, on the chemicals and toxics uh, along the way. Uh, and uh, on the product's uh, uh, consumption, uh, it's, uh, and on the energy as, uh, and greenhouse gas emissions uh, as well. So those are the, the what of the impacts that you see uh, along the top. So <clears throat> I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation this morning giving you a, a look under the hood at this index because uh, I want to, well, I want to spend more time on this than, than the other parts of the presentation, because I, I really think what we've got going here is, is a game changer. But before we get into uh, the details of it, let's uh, pause and talk about the history of this, because it started with a couple of uh, iconic brands. Uh, Walmart, who had come to us years before to seek our advice on integrating organically grown cotton into some of their privately produced apparel, which we did. Uh, and then uh, in 2009, we invited them to partner with us to invite a select group of companies into a coalition with the goal of developing this uh, index tool. So I met with several high-level Walmart executives and I, and I told them about, you know, I pitched them the idea and they said, you know, okay, you know, let's do it. And I went, whoa. I said, let's call the, let's code name it David and Goliath. Uh, and they said, uh, well, okay, we'll do this, but uh, there's one caveat. And I got, oh, you know, I was waiting for that. And they said, the caveat is that we're David and you're Goliath. So I said, okay, whatever. In <laughs> 2009, we sent out a letter with the logos of Patagonia and Walmart uh, on the masthead, side by side, and it went out to the CEOs of a a dozen other companies, uh, 
and we invited them to attend a meeting where, in quote, we expect to achieve consensus on the need for a universally accepted approach for measuring apparel sector sustainability and to establish a strategy for ongoing collaboration to create and implement that standard. And as one um, executive later told me, when you get a letter with the logos of Patagonia and Walmart on the masthead side by side, it's so bizarre that you just don't throw it away. <laughs> well, in April 2010, we, we had our first meeting. And we had really carefully considered the strategy to invite in companies only that would be willing to work together to build the strongest possible tool with nobody in the room trying to weaken it, but at the same time get enough companies with enough size to what we referred to as gravitational pull. It's an amazing group of world-class companies that have moved forward at a pace that frankly I think has surprised even those of us that have been in this thing from the very beginning. In just over um, a year we have added many more members. Major apparel brands, more big manufacturers and suppliers, more footwear companies that are developing an index for the prod, their own products. Um, there's about one new company um, a week right now and already we have approximately 30% of the global market share for both apparel and footwear. Um, but most importantly, everyone has worked really, really hard in a completely pre-competitive environment so that in little, just over a year, we have version 1.0 of our index tool and that's ready to go live in the supply chain of every one of our members. We've already seen how this index is going to measure the impact of a product along its life cycle, you know, from cradle to grave, but the real driver to change and the real strength of the index is that each category of impact is also scored uh, in 0 to 100 ratings with 100 the lowest or the best environmental and social labor impacts. Now the index also has three views and you can think of this as three different ways of looking uh, at the information. Uh, and in what we're calling the brand view, the scores from the various categories of a product's impacts uh, are going to be rolled up into a single product footprint or rating and then all the products that a company makes will further be rolled up into overall ratings for, for the brand. Uh, and then in addition to just uh, the brand ratings, there's also other uh, measurements of, uh, of governance uh, and environmental and social values uh, of a company or a brand that get folded into this. So to give you a sense of what this looks like, here's a page from uh, the index that's currently in beta testing in the supply chain of all the uh, companies uh, right now. And in this case, we're looking at three aspects of a company's responsibility with chemicals that are used in a supply chain, whether they have a list of restricted chemicals, how transparent they are with, those chemi with their chemical policy, and whether they have a good verification and certification system in place. So uh, the index right now is over 50 pages long of things like this. But the real value of this comes when all the scores are rolled up uh, into this overall score for a brand. And now to illustrate the impacts of this, just imagine that you're the chief merchant of a large retailer, maybe one that's already a member of the coalition, and you're sitting down with the CEO of Brand X. And the chief merchant then takes out the index with all its rolled up ratings of Brand X's performance, and it reviews it with the CEO. And the guy says, you know, look, your rating on the VCI report I just got is 78%, but your competitor here uh, just down the street in brand Y has come in at 85%. Now, this is a problem for us and, and I got to tell you if we don't see in some improvement, we're not talking about five years from now. We all know that business is a series of choices. So this is a kind of a mock scenario that I pulled from a very, very large retailer, who I won't name, but take one guess, who said, you know, this is maybe exactly how we can use this tool. Well, the second way the tool can be used by companies to lower impacts is through the fact review. And this was developed so that buyers in companies can judge the ratings of one factory over another when making their supply chain decisions. <clears throat> and they get to view and measure the impacts that are environmental, like energy and water use, green, greenhouse gas emissions, toxics, hazardous waste. But also, in development right now is another module soon to be inserted into the index that measures uh, social and labor impacts 
with things like wages and benefits and working hours and conditions, health and safety, and whether there's uh, child labor. Now, the third way the tool is going to be used by companies to lower impacts is through the product view. And this was developed so that product designers, as well as production people, could see instant results from the choices that they have to make, especially in material selection and sourcing. So to illustrate how this works, let's go back to where we started the presentation with that uh, pair of genes and with all the impact that those genes had on the environment. So let's go back to the beginning of that pair of genes life with the designer who designed them. And let's imagine that she's just received a memo from her department head saying that her company's CEO has issued a, a, a directive saying that all the products have to meet a higher rating with the VCI index. Now what this designer may or may not know is that her company CEO just had this meeting with the CEO of the big retailer uh, who told them that they've got to improve their overall brand score. So using the index tool, the designer sees that the genes are coming in with too low of a score. So the first thing she does is choose organically grown cotton instead of traditionally grown cotton. But immediately her score, so immediately the score improves, but she sees that it's still short of her goal. And further, she sees that she's being penalized because she hasn't indicated where she's going to source the organically grown cotton. Now she has swatches representing her options from different cotton vendors. So she chooses uh, one from a cotton vendor in China who in turn has sourced the cotton fiber from farms, let's say in western China. Now the designer sees that uh, the score has improved again, but she's still missing her goal because the cotton in western China may be grown without insecticides and pesticides, but it's still being grown using water that's drawing down unsustainably an aquifer beyond its ability to replenish itself. So back to the swatches. Well, there's another one that meets her quality standards, and it's from India. So she selects this one. She sees that the cotton fiber comes from farms in southern India that are growing cotton water by rainfall. So she finds her score is still not perfect because the cotton farmers are using catchment cisterns that in turn capture some of the rainfall that's preventing that from getting back into the aquifer. It's still not perfect, but yet the overall score has now allowed her to reach her goals. And the designer of her genes have, uh, ha have met her goals, but along the way, even though it's not perfect, she significantly reduced the impact. But the fact that she has met her goals by achieving a rating that was a roll-up of impacts, um, thinking of it as an overall rating for the product, means that the, the rating could also be available to consumers. But how would you show that rating? as a label on packaging, on a hang tag, or how would you find out if it was there, what it means, what's behind the number? Well, <coughs> we are in the coalition are ultimately interested in exploring how this might be consumer facing. So one model out there that I suspect many of you are familiar with is, uh, is Good Guy, where consumers can check out on their website uh, and find the rating on a product. But a more cool way is to download the Good Guide app onto your smartphone, which some of you guys have probably done, because that allows you to go into a store where you can take a product you want to know more about, uh, scan the barcode on your phone, and, and get ratings in three categories, in health impacts, environmental impacts, and social impacts. So if you want to know more about uh, the uh, ratings, you flip the card, you select more about this product, you can see what goes behind the rating. But therein lies a big problem, because uh, while Good Guide has product ratings now for over 100,000 products in a little over 600 categories, and they've got a team of researchers that are gathering ratings and sustainability indicators on all these products that they evaluate, they still have a, a weakness in their system that they admit, and it's because it, it's too opaque and it's too inconsistent across the various categories of manufactured uh, products. And, 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 and they know this. But what if Good Guide were coupled to a full cradle to grave impact assessment tool like this index that we're creating in uh, apparel and, and footwear? Well, you can see where that could go. It could solve their problems and also it instantly make our index consumer facing. So we're in conversations with Good Guide uh, about uh, that. Uh, but also, <coughs> 
Let's, um, you know, and, and, and also another benefit would be that you have all the, um, the brands in a category, or at least most of them, like we're getting in apparel and footwear now, that are promoting uh, the rating uh, on their uh, products, and that gives the customers a real apple-to-apple -apple comparison or rating uh, that whether they're in Walmart or Patagonia, they know has the same tool behind it. So now imagine if this rating was standardized and replicated in other sectors of manufactured goods uh, until all categories of manufactured goods were using the same system so that when you go into a store, uh, it's universal across it. Well, this is the, like the holy grail of standardization, and it's the, the, the dream out on the distant horizon for what we've started in uh, apparel and footwear. Now, imagine the increase in awareness that those customers would have about the true impact of the goods on the air and the water and the health, and now imagine how that could translate into political influence, where all those customers using the index uh, could start to influence their legislatures. And there's also another potential way that value chain indexes could create the political will that we think is needed ultimately to pass policy and regulation and legislation that's going to internalize the true costs of business on the environment and the societies. Uh, and understanding this, to understand this, let's go back to the index and, and the ratings that come out of each category of impact. And in particular, let's look at the first one, the, the source materials for all manufactured goods, the cotton and the t-shirt and the water that was used to grow it and the petroleum that provided the energy for the machines that farm it. And taken together, what is the impact on the, on the, on the rivers and the water systems, on the clean air and the arable land that allows us to grow our food and our fiber, and on the forests that give us fuel and, and wood, and on the earth that gives us the minerals and the oil and the coal that all together provide these ecosystem services that are the foundation of all business. And, and without these natural services, there is no business. So the first and essential step to internalizing these currently externalized costs is currently underway with efforts to assign dollar values to ecosystem services. You know, what's the value of pollinators to agricultural production, for example? And, that's now been estimated as $200 billion a year. So what might happen if these dollar-based ecosystem service valuations were integrated into our supply chain index? What if the materials part of a value chain index, instead of just a rating, instead of having a rating under it, had a dollar value assigned with it, so that there was an actual true cost of those insecticides and pesticides in your genes made with traditionally grown cotton, or even the value of that aquifer in China that's being drawn down by organic cotton farmers. Well, already there's rough estimates on the combined value of all the planet's ecosystem services, and it's staggering. The World Bank calculates that they are collectively valued at $44 trillion, and $29 trillion of that belongs to developing nations. So figures like this, it's our prediction that once the index, like we're uh, creating has been integrated into these dollar-based ecosystem valuations, then the true cost on the planet of doing business is going to become increasingly visible to everyone, and that's going to result in a major shift in the political climate and political will to pass the legislation to internalize externalized costs. And there's already the first indications of this happening with the uh, laws that are on the books in Great Britain. Uh, some of you know about those sustainability laws uh, in uh, the EU uh, as well. And of course, here in California with uh, AB 32. Uh, there's also uh, an interesting perspective in France called the uh, Grinnell Dua laws. Um, and those were passed in 2010, and they're going to require uh, labels affixed to consumer products that give shoppers information uh, in several categories about the full environmental impact, including greenhouse gas emissions. And the most interesting part of this law is its requirement to have these measurements based on life cycle assessment uh, data. And that opens the possibility that our VCI that we've got in development, just in apparel and footwear, uh, could be picked up by the French and inserted as the tool they need into this law to really make it happen uh, on the ground. And if things like that start to happen, then 
let's go back to our country. Would we then have a new political climate where the cap and trade bill that was defeated in the House two years ago could actually get through? And with true transparency, with full transparency over the true costs of economic activity on the planet's environment and on our societies, would we be able to uh, pass additional laws that would reduce carbon and uh, not only reduce carbon, but increase the cost of unsustainable business practices over more sustainable options and that will quickly emerge because the regulation places them in a comparatively favorable environment. So what would the combined result be? Well, we uh, who are working on this have uh, thought this through and it's the result that we published uh, in last October's issue of the Harvard Business Review where we said the result of that if you got global legislation to internalize, externalize costs is what we defined as sustainability 3.0. And that's when the jeans or the t-shirt <coughs> that uh, is made with least harm or no unnecessary harm to the environment costs less than the t-shirt that is more sustainable. So to us, that should be the holy grail of uh, all of our efforts in sustainability. Well, that is a summary of our Apparel Coalition uh, effort. Uh, it's now uh, a little less than two years old, and we're pretty super proud of what we've pulled off in such a short amount of time. And it's a good example of that last part of our mission statement of how we can use our business of Patagonia to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. So thank you so much for uh, you know, sitting through my presentation. Uh, I know we've still got uh, some time left uh, for questions and answers, right? I hope. So again, uh, we'll move into that phase now. Thanks so much. Um, I was curious with regards to the Common Threads initiative, how were you able to win over the sales team and make them really embrace the, the idea? Well, um, I, had to, I had to do it in y using, I had to play their game. So, and, but I had to do it in a way that was you know, not misleading. So it was through the, uh, the component of trying to persuade our customers to not only buy less, but to buy smarter. And that to uh, buy smarter meant to look for products that were gonna last a long time. Uh, that that, but buying less and buying smart together uh, the message was uh, that can arguably be uh, have the biggest impact of anything that either customers or businesses can do immediately to lower the impact of, of stuff. And then I uh, told our people that if we really continue to meet our mission statement to make the best stuff there is, that the biggest component of the best making the best product is making stuff that is durable that lasts a long time. That's completely integral to what we do as a business. And so I said, we have a potential win-win here to um, still sell stuff, but to sell stuff in a model that's really going to reduce the overall impact of stuff on the planet. So I think of it that way. And you know, there's always gonna be a yin and yang and a push, and we might fall short here and there, but we are obligated to commit to the best product we can make, and that's consistent with this message. And if overall the amount of stuff on the planet is gonna go down, the people buy and consume, then we can still be successful as a business if we continue to provide quality products to people that understand this. That even if they're buying less, we'll still be healthy. We'll still have a market share, and other people that are making stuff that is more fashionable and trendy and doesn't last long, uh, are ultimately going to f suffer. So they, it was a, you know, a long, I mean, it took years. <laughs> These were long conversations uh, that we had at the company. But eventually that was the, 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 the idea that prevailed, the realization that prevailed that allowed us to all align behind this. Thank you. I teach a course on sustainability in design. And one of the texts that I use is put out by the Industrial Designers Society of America. It's called Ocala Manual. Mm -hmm. And 
it starts from first principles of the natural world. And one thing that the manual points out is that it, there are two kinds of ecosystems, a mature ecosystem and an immature ecosystem. And the immature ecosystem devotes most of its energy to growth, while a mature ecosystem devotes most of its energy to recycling materials. Do you think that business in the 21st century can come up with a model that would be based on a mature ecosystem that recycles materials? Boy, that's cool. I didn't I'll, know about I'll that. send you would a you? copy of the Ocala. I think you would yeah, really I mean, enjoy it. We're always trying to find inspiration from the natural world about how it goes about its business. Mm -hmm that would inform how you know, we should go about our business. And we're not just talking about biomimicry, we're talking about no. systems mimicry. <laughs> yes. That's what we're looking for, and that's a, that's a cool one. Um, but, to, but to your question, I, you know, I don't, uh, I'm with you, I, we all certainly hope so, but at the, at the root of the problem is an economy that's based on, on growth, that you, know, you can't succeed without annual growth. We hear that every day of our lives. We hear that every time we turn on this television and listen to the presidential debates going on right now. You'll hear that in every boardroom. Uh, and, and, and how in the world can we get beyond that and still live uh, you know, our, our, our lives in some semblance of the way we're doing it now? I mean, we're talking about a shift in the way business is done <clears throat> that sounds to me more, found, more of a foundational shift uh, than the move to the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the move to a post-industrial sustainable uh, business economy has to somehow tackle this problem of an economy or a system based on annual growth. And I believe that's at, that is at the root of what your question is, and that is the dilemma under whatever solution might emerge. And in Patagonia, we are quick to point out to people that we have no idea what the answer to that is. But what we do know is that without an answer, we are heading for that cliff that I told you about early in the presentation, where you just run those numbers, you pencil them out, and any business person is going to conclude that you can't be in business when you've bankrupted the planet at 500% beyond capacity. So something's got to shift in a foundational way, and we don't know what that is. We want to get the conversation started, and we hope that an ad like we ran in the New York Times is the very beginning of that. So I don't have an answer to that, but I love your analogy. Yeah, please do send that one to me. So a mature system is based on recycling. It is the forest, the old growth forest. Wow, I don't know. And we could be here, you know, I, I'd have to probably go back to Ventura week after next if we'd stay here and try to figure this one out. <laughs> but what a cool dilemma that is for um, all of you in the room who are just getting out into the world to, to start. Because uh, it's up to you guys to find the answer to that one. You're going to have to face that in your professional lives, I predict. Uh, I think, uh, again, that uh, looking at the, um, the trends and the numbers from a mega trend perspective, uh, the only conclusion is that uh, those solutions will have to come from you guys. Thank you. Hi, I really enjoyed Hi. your presentation. Thanks. I wondered if you could speak a little bit more to the role of consumer demand in driving these type of changes, the development of the Eco Index, and the willingness of the partners to come together to try and develop it together. We've seen that a lot in the natural foods and organic cool. foods world that cool. you know, Walmart chose to adopt a lot of those products for their customers. And sometimes when it comes to clothing, selling organic cotton doesn't have the same resonance as something that you put in your body and consume. But I'm curious about how you see the relationship between this index driving new Great. consumer demand. So, but there's two big questions there, if I heard you right. You know, one question is the consumer demand question. What, what, how big of a driver is that? The other one is, why are these companies doing this? What's motivating them to join your coalition and, and pursue these goals, right? Yes. Okay, so first one. Uh, from a larger perspective, uh, consumer influence, uh, whatever you want to call it, pushback uh, on business is going to be a big driver. But 
I predict it's going to be smaller than some of the other drivers that are going to affect, that are in the, in the end of the day, we hope, affect this change. And uh, the biggest one is the businesses themselves, and that's going to lead to your second question, uh, because I think efforts like this apparel coalition can uh, drive more change than even um, consumer influence uh, on companies can, per some of the things that I listed in the presentation at, at, at the end. So uh, just the demand, the B2B changes that a measurement tool like this can have in the way business is done could have huge impacts. Look at the way the index might be used in the scenarios I outlined in the presentation, uh, you know, by uh, CEOs talking to uh, merchants talking to CEOs. That could drive huge change. And the big retailers in our group uh, are very interested in using a tool just for that, which again touches on the second part of your question. Or again, the other scenarios that I listed, uh, you know, with the, with the buyers and the relationships with their vendors and with the designers, those are potentially going to be enormous changes. The, the tool is being beta tested in the supply chains right now. And there's other results of this that are starting to come in right now that we hadn't even thought of, not surprisingly. There was one uh, big vendor in China who uh, saw all of his clients uh, about to use the same tool and, and is meeting with his architectural firm that he third parties with in China to design his new factories around the outputs of the index. So that he wants to design the factories to minimize uh, the, or to in, improve the rating that he'll get from the index tool. We never imagined that as an outcome. So these are examples of how a measurement tool can have enormous impact. Uh, and I think that we're going to see uh, more of those. The end of the day, it's up to government to pass this regulation legislation. As I told you at the end, I, I don't know. I, I have thought this through. My colleagues have. We've, you know, we're, we're mountain climbers and river rafters and stuff, so we, we don't want to mislead you guys to think, you know, we're some sort of, you know, social guru, you know, people to, to see into the crystal ball. But as much as we've been able to apply our own um, uh, analysis to where we need to go, it all comes back to internalizing those externalized costs. And, and that isn't going to happen without regulation and policy. It's just not. Uh, There'll always be a company out there that takes the, if you don't have those regulations, that's going to go to the lowest cost, biggest impact option. Always. That's the way markets work. You know that. So that's got to change. Now, how do you do that? Well, again, this is the, your question. Consumers are going to have a big component of that, but we predict that businesses themselves are going to have uh, an even bigger influence on governments. And we also are starting to see, as I say in that Harvard article, uh, and Andrew can tell you about this, that the tool's starting to get picked up by uh, equity investors right now as another tool to put into their toolbox when they evaluate companies uh, for um, investors. And that can have an enormous influence. I don't need to tell you where that could go. You should you know, read the article. And we were in touch with some gurus in the, in the social responsible investing community who looked at the tool, who used it, and gave us their feedback. It was really positive. So that, I think, is also going to be a big driver. So now, why are people doing Why are the companies doing this? That's pretty, that's a, we've thought about that, too, uh, as much as we could apply our noggins to it. And we come up with five drivers behind their, the, behind these companies, um, interest in joining an effort like this. And the first one is the simple one, to reduce costs. That's simple because that's the first stage of sustainability. Uh, just go into Walmart's history of their path down sustainability and you understand how uh, they bought into it uh, six or seven years ago now, initially, because they could do better while reducing costs. You know, when they took uh, and re designed the package for Hamburger Helper, they took um, nine, I'm trying to remember the statistics, I can't remember how many tens of millions of tons of cardboard came out of the supply chain in one year, but I do remember that just in North America, it took 500 semis off the road by changing the packaging in Hamburger Helper. So that's a lot of money, and they saw that. The, the second 
driver is that they also saw a brand enhancement. Uh, and they also started to realize as they thought that one through, the flip side of brand enhancement is driver number three, and that's risk control. And uh, they could get both wins uh, out of the same effort. Then the fourth driver is the companies in the room <coughs> that are starting to watch the political landscape on a global level. And they're seeing that climate change law in the UK, and they're seeing that Grenelle Dua law in France uh, on the books now. And another one that's in development uh, in the EU is called Echo Label. That effort is progressing quickly. Uh, and it is actually quite similar to what we're doing with our, our index work. They're looking at the development of an index there that they would put into policy across all EU countries requiring, like the Grinnell Du laws do, um, a index rating on everything that's sold in the U EU. So I don't need to tell you what the impact of that's going to be. And the companies are watching that. So their interest in the coalition is to get ahead of that legislation. And you might immediately assume, like most people would, hypocritical reasons for doing that to influence the legislation and make it you know, weaker to water it down so they don't have to be as compliant to a, a, a higher standard. But in fact, the companies in the room in our group are starting to see in that EU legislation uh, directives that are non-implementable because the people in Brussels are not business people. They don't know the supply chain. And they're coming up with stuff right now that no company could actually um, comply with. It's impossible. So there's more headaches out there that's going to have to be resolved that could be solved up front going into it with a collaboration with a group like ours so that the legislation and policy they do come out with is, 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 is achievable, realistically achievable. And that dialogue is starting right now with the EU. So the companies are really seeing that the fourth advantage is getting ahead of that inevitable legislation. Now remember, this is legislation that's beginning to internalize, externalize costs. It's happening right now. It's happening here in this state. The fifth one is the most interesting one of all. And when I mention these to people and <clears throat> you get some skeptical responses like, yeah, sure, they're trying to influence legislation. I know why. Well, this one really brings the skeptic or the cynics out in the audience. But I was trying, I've been try trying to be as skeptical as I can uh, in, as I get to know the senior executives in these big companies, answer that question myself. Why are you doing this? And for two years now, I've been meeting you know, at fairly high levels, sometimes at the sea level in these giant companies. Uh, and I'm increasingly convinced that more and more, every month, certainly every year, those high level executives are doing this because they're getting, they're getting scared. They're starting to see those trends that I just told you. And they're worried about the health of their companies and they're worried about the health of their families and their kids. And they're more and more getting committed to doing the right thing, <clears throat> to doing something about that as individuals and as business people. That's the fifth one, is to uh, do the right thing. Hi, thank you, uh, thank you for this initiative. It's uh, uh, really just remarkable what, 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 you, what you're doing. Um, I had a few questions about it. Um, you mentioned how key it was for Patagonia um, being a private company and, and allowing that to um, have a focused mission. I'm wondering how we can address this, the, uh, the challenge of uh, establishing a consensus on the values in this value chain. How are we going to be able to, with all these different parties, agree on, on values that are really meaningful? Um, that's the first part of my question. And the second part is with the uh, technology of the research and technology and sustainability is seems to be changing so rapidly right now in terms of green green chemistry and impacts on the environment and uh, uh, greenhouse gas research. How do we not only find this consensus 
um, but have enough flexibility built into the system that with emerging research we can continue to tweak these values and make sure we're headed in the right direction? Well, um, the first part of, of the question to build consensus, I, I think we've shown that we can do that now with our peril coalition. I think that's proof of uh, consensus building around a common goal uh, to you know, reduce environmental impact through uh, a common measurement tool. I mean, that's consensus. And we've spent part of the morning discussing how, what the outcomes of that might, might be. Um, at the same time, our effort is multi-constituent so that it doesn't just uh, include businesses because up front, when Walmart first joined us to think out this idea before we sent that letter out to a single company, we spent eight months trying to think through what would make this thing uh, work. And one of the very first things we realized is it couldn't be a business-driven initiative, that it would immediately be suspected, especially by governments, of being only in the business interest. So right from the beginning, in addition to the 12 companies that we sent that letter out to, we sent out uh, letters of invitation to uh, some government agencies, to uh, universities, and to NGOs. And uh, several of them joined. Uh, the EPA has sat at, in on our uh, meetings, uh, every single one from the very first one, for example. And we're in these discussions with the EU and the UK right now. And the French, the French Grinnell Dua people came to our last uh, in-person meeting in Stockholm. Uh, and presented and then listened to what we were doing. So we've got an engagement going with them. Uh, we have several big NGOs uh, that are not just part of the coalition, but actively engage in it. So that the Environmental Defense Fund has been at every single meeting we've had, and they're on the board of directors, and they drive what happens in the coalition. So does the NRDC. So we've got Duke University as one of the sustainability leaders in the country. We've got the Utrecht University and the EU. And uh, through them, we have other universities that they're associated with in uh, departments that are focused on um, life cycle assessment data science in the room. So we have these LCA specialist scientists there working with, with us side by side. So we're multi-constituent. Again, that's consensus. You know? So I, I think we've, sh we've proved a model for achieving the consensus that you asked about in, in, the, in the first part. Uh, you know, uh, of your question. So remind me of the second part again. I was just talking about um, how we can keep those, have those values be flexible s still. Yeah. Um, you know, if well. we s setting them in, s concerned about setting them in place and then, for example, with, you know, ethanol, we, uh, in this country, we've made such a big push to use ethanol as a fuel and now there's, uh, in, in a lot of ways, it's doing some environmental harm. And I'm trying to uh, think about how the values can maintain a flexibility so as research evolves in areas of sustainability, we continue to be on the right track. Yeah, that's a, I, I got it. Well, let's start by saying that what we're doing with this index tool doesn't involve um, a, a, a value, that it's a, it's a rating. It's, a, it's, a, it's an agnostic number. And the number doesn't say whether one, you know, it, the, the number just measures environmental impact and soon social labor impacts as unbi in as unbiased a way as possible. So it isn't a standard. It's not um, shade-grown coffee. And it's not, you know, trying to Achieve, and it's not proposing a threshold benchmark for anybody to be in the coalition. You've got to have your ratings here, and if it's here, you can't join. If it's here, you get invited to come in. That's not what it's about. Uh, we thought it was a lot smarter just to measure accurately and ag as agnostically as possible those impacts, because just the measurement alone is going to have enormous effect and change. And one of them, we predict, is going to be the development of best technology to solve some of these problems. And if we can make this index meet our vision, so that the vision is that a designer making that pair of jeans or that t-shirt does have visibility over where the organically grown cotton comes from, so that for the first time in her career, 
She has to learn about rainfall versus aquifer irrigation of cotton. She never thought about that before. And policymakers in Washington, if the tool achieves its vision, would know in advance that ethanol is going to have a huge impact on the commodity price of corn, which is going to have an impact on the starving people in Africa. Those things get linked through measurement, just through the visibility of knowing the consequences of one decision over another. That is so powerful. But the policies and the, that come out of it, the, the new technology that could come out of this too, is not what the index is about. That is up to the companies using the index to try and figure out. Now, there's a lot of discussion in our coalition that goes on constantly with companies that are saying, well, you know, we, once we get this done and we're measuring, can't, since we're all together in the room, all committed towards improvement, uh, all get together to develop new technologies to improve the ratings that are going to come out of this? And the answer for me, anyway, right now is maybe. Uh, we want to make this consumer facing, maybe. We got all these maybes, but let's just focus on the tool right now. So, uh, using the coalition for other outcomes is possible in the future. That would potentially address some of the things that you're talking about right there. Um, when I first sat down with Nike, uh, who was one of the companies we initially invited in, um, I presented it to their sustainability team at you know, a very high level. And they said, well, it sounds like a good idea, but um, you know, we're at max capacity right now. Your idea's got to be better than something else that's on our plate because it's going to displace something. <laughs> so we're skept they, were, they were really skeptical about this thing. And then they said, at the end of the day, you got to convince us that this tool is going to allow us to develop technology that makes the water coming out of our factory more potable than the water that goes into it. And they said, that's our goal. Show us how we can get there, and, and we'll sign up. So you know, I had to do more song and dance, and you know, just like I'm doing with you guys, you know, just give them the, the full vision here. And eventually, they joined. And now they, they are the. You know, they're one of the, I, want to say, I was about to say they are the, the driving, the main driving force in the coalition. They're certainly right up there with the top companies. Uh, and when people, you know, sometimes ask me, well, you know, who's the most sustainable company in your group? You know, we got 50 companies in this group now. And, and I tell you, I, I think, I hold Nike up as maybe uh, the leader on the planet for uh, sustainability commitment right now. Those guys are unbelievably awesome. And they're really driving this thing. In fact, they called me up last week, <coughs> and they said, we just had a, a meeting, at, and they're talking about CEO right on down. There's like four or five guys running that, men and women running that company. And, they, and, and we know what's going on in the EU. Uh, we're following that legislation. And we think you guys have uh, the best chance of um, influencing it. They, said, they told me that last week. I went, oh, man, we, <laughs> we've come a long ways in the 18 months we've been working on this together. And then I said, well, we can, but we've got to have boots on the ground. And then they said they signed up for more, uh, um, uh, um, uh, an additional financial commitment to our effort. So I really take my hat off to those guys. Anyway, that's the answer to your question, I think, uh, about um, you know, how you can use this for uh, better decisions. The ethanol is a good, that's a, a great example of, and again, if there, were, uh, if there were an index tool like we have in place, before those decisions were made, they might have gone in a different direction. We've run out of time, so it's, it's time to let uh, Rick get ready for his next meeting. <laughs> but I want to thank, uh, join me in thanking Rick for, for coming and doing this. <laughs>